Okay, like Sandy said, I'm Aaron. I'm the CEO of Maiden Space. I'm also going to talk about 3D printing, but I'm going to talk about bringing it to space. So Maiden Space is the space manufacturing company. Our goal is to bring manufacturing to space. Um, we're launching the first 3D printer to space. Next year, it's going up on SpaceX 5. That's going to be about August. Time frames we're looking at right now. Those slip up and down sometimes. Um, we're a profitable space startup. We've got several contracts with NASA and the government. And uh, the most exciting thing about our 3D printers in space is that everybody in this room will be able to use them. You'll essentially be able to email your hardware to space through us. So the first question I usually get is how did it start? Um, in many ways, it started right here at Singularity University. And we came out of a GSP program in 2010. And GSP is a lot like these EPs, except it's 10 weeks of mind-blowing fun rather than one. Um, I still remember when Peter, uh, Salim, Rob, others that founded SU were asking us, hey, go impact a billion people in 10 years. They're essentially saying, hey, go create the Walmarts, the Googles, the Facebooks, the big companies that lead our world. Um, and at first, you know, with that challenge came excitement. You know, then came a little bit of panic. But you know, we took that challenge head on. I actually personally attended SU because I really had this you know, uh, inner passion to help make humanity a multi-planetary species. I really felt like we should colonize our solar system, and I thought it was something that if really focused on, it could be done in my lifetime. So I came to SU to meet some other forward-thinking individuals. Um, I put up this quote here of Carl Sagan talking about the pale blue dot right after Voyager was you know, uh, passing Saturn. And if you look really, really closely uh, following that arrow, you could see Earth um, and just how small we really, really are. And that's really the passion that drives this company. So when I met my co-founders at SU, we, we really started with this question of why aren't we multiplanetary today? What's the problem? You, know, you can't solve something if you really don't know at the heart of what, what is wrong with it. Um, and we, you know, we quickly realized uh, you know, that it, there's a supply chain problem in space. You have expensive transportation vehicles. You have to travel long dis distances. This causes it to be very risky, time consuming. And then more importantly, for us out here in Silicon Valley, this, all this inhibits innovation. So if you don't have innovation, you're really not going to you know, spread out throughout the solar system. So we identified you know, on-demand manufacturing, 3D printing as a solution, in large part thanks to SU. You know, they were ahead of the curve on that one. Now everybody knows about the buzz of 3D printing. In 2010, everybody in this room I'd probably ask, and maybe two would put their hands up about knowing what it is. Um, so it's being called the third industrial revolution, 3D printing and now 4D printing. I'm not sure if you guys talked about that yet. Um, but that essentially is changing the way we think we get things from point A to point B. Um, so today, the way goods are manufactured in America is you know, it's generally manufactured in another country. Uh, then it's put on a crate. The crate's then put on a ship. That ship is then shipped halfway around the world. The crate's then taken off the ship. It's put on a truck. Truck's taken to a warehouse, and so on and so forth. And 3D printing has the capability to, dis to disrupt that. Um, and it's even more so in space when you have rockets and long lead times. It can be 10 times more effective when you can build there on demand. So we founded Maiden Space with one goal in 2010, to bring that to space. Um, and really quickly after we were founded, we, we took our research to the skies. We've done about a million dollars in zero gravity research of additive manufacturing on these microgravity planes. Um, I've personally done over 400 parabolas myself. Um, and we've tested many different technologies in, in, in zero gravity. This was our first NASA contract that we got in 2011. And our original goal was to actually adapt one of these off-the-shelf printers you know, for, for, zero, you know, for, for space. Um, primarily, we just wanted to build things in space as quickly as possible. Uh, we really quickly learned that a more realistic goal was to build a custom printer, because none of these printers worked you know, as is in microgravity. So if you look at the column on the left, you, if you look really closely, you can see quite a bit of errors in the layering. Um, it was supposed to be a straight column. It's much wider in, in the zero gravity portions. Column on the right printed straight through in zero gravity, um, 1G and 2G. And that was the after we made the adaptations to make it a zero gravity printer. We also had, oh man, this is really fun. Uh, we also had quite a bit of fun. This is supposed to be a video. I don't know why it didn't play. Um, but it was me uh, spinning around at about 60 rotations per minute in the fetal position in zero gravity. Um, we had a lot of fun. They call it the Vomit Comet for a reason, but I didn't throw up. Um, so after we solved the gravity problem, we had to go solve all the many other problems for building a printer in, for space. You know, we, we had to you know, solve the environmental issues, ruggedizing it for launch. Um, you know, that's important because you have to survive up to 10 Gs you know, when, when launching a, when launching a, a printer. Um, 
you know, made it uh, solve thermal issues, made it mission critical, something that you could count on uh, if, in, in the case of emergency. So then we, after we built the printer, um, our first printer, we took it to NASA, NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, um, who's our partners in sending the first printer to space. And what we learned there is essentially that our printer was ready to go 18 months prior to launch. So it could have been launched as is, still not going to be launched because of all the supply chain issues with space. That, that at the core is really the heart of the problem we're trying to solve. 18 months, you know, I've got to pay a dozen guys salary just to find out if our first product's going to even work. That's a big problem. Um, so here's the, you know, where the printer's going to go in the ISS. It's called the glove box. Astronaut has to float around while putting his hands in these stationary gloves. So it's a difficult process, so much so that the astronaut, uh, the NASA told us to make the printer so easy that an eight-year-old could use it. That was our guiding requirement there. Um, and the next stop is the International Space Station. So uh, in 2014, it's going to be the year that the first part is truly manufactured off planet Earth. Um, and more importantly, the astronauts get a, a big upgrade over the duct tape they've been using all these years. Um, so we're going to take it from Houston, we have a problem, to Houston, we have a solution. A really quick story here, most people know about the Apollo 13 incident. They're running out of breathable air. If they didn't solve the issue, the astronauts were going to die because um, too, too much carbon dioxide in, in, in the uh, module. And essentially it took them a couple dozen rocket scientists for a little over a day um, to figure out a way to MacGyver a solution with all the stuff on station. Um, as comparison, we, sticked, we stuck an intern on the same problem. He hadn't even graduated college yet, but gave him a, the capability to use a 3D printer and said, you have one hour to come up with a solution. He had a solution in an hour and had it printed within a couple hours. This is a big example of how you know, 3D printing is game-changing in space. So we like to say you know, printer on the ISS is, you know, will be very useful, but some type of building technology on the way to Mars is going to be absolutely essential. Um, so, so uh, you know, we're also going to be building, you know, not just emergency fixes, but tools, spare t parts, standard hardware, experiments, really making it a test bed, you know, for future manufacturing in space. Um, but again, more importantly, this is going to be a platform for everyone to use. So I just gave a talk to a bunch of makers who are really excited about building, tech, you know, building hardware in space. I've t we've talked to one-man entrepreneurs who are going to be launching uh, or building using our, our technology hardware to upgrade several experiments in the space station. That's kind of unheard of in the space industry. We have one man who can you know, take, take hardware to space. Really game changing. We're working with other governments as well, not just NASA, not just America, ESA, JAXA, I think other, other, uh, other government agencies and space agencies as well. Really to make this, again, a platform to open up space for all. That's really, really our goal. Um, Mean, meanwhile, we're building, using this as a building block towards the future. We're going to be building off this ISS hardware. We're already printing with using the same similar technology with metals, with lunar regolith, asteroid materials, moon materials, looking at building large structures in space. So with that in mind, I'd like to invite anyone here, if you're interested in using you know, advanced manufacturing or in this topic, to really push humanity further out into space. And if you're interested in seeing how this is going to build a future of building on the moon, asteroids, building extremely large structures in space, building in remote locations on demand to disrupt supply chains, supply chains down here, then, uh, then please contact me. Either way, we're doing, what, doing our part to go impact a billion people in 10 years. Thank you. Also, we are in the middle of really trying to find like a rock star material scientist or engineer. So if you know anybody or are one, please come talk to me. Great. That's, right, that's a great pitch. Um, yeah, talent. How, how important is it to find talent? Um, I'll have uh, our on-deck uh, speaker come over here in the on-deck spot, please. And any questions for Made in Space? We have one here. That was mentioned on one of your So slides. 40... It, <laughs> um, it, I think it might depend on who you ask, but it's a, it's a essentially uh, a way where you can do assembly of objects um, right out the gate and using some type of stimuli, stimulus to actually uh, to build an object up using that type of technology. So the way we're looking at it is made in space. Is imagine if you know we use our printer, um, we print up something. Um, and then using with certain material characteristics, uh, once it's hit hit with like radiation in the, in the vacuum of space, it then can transform 
you know, whatever part it is into another part that you'd want it to be. So in our case, we're looking at, you know, uh, imagine you, you build like a, a flat satellite, throw it out in the vacuum of space, then it folds up into a cube or maybe a dish or something like that. It's, oh, it's, it's a buzzword. Yeah. yeah, it's just a buzzword. Yeah. I didn't name it, by the way. Maybe Web 2.0. But if you, it, there is a really good TED talk, Skylar Tibbetts online, on 40 printing. Just a quick question. I think um, I'm sure you get asked this question a lot that, you know, what if we don't send too many people into space? What, what will happen to the technology? But I think the question that I want to I ask actually is, you know, there's a lot of things that we learned uh, in the process of space exploration that made life on Earth much better. How would you, what lessons from, you know, building products in space would actually make 3D printing better on the ground? Yeah, so um, it's a really, really good question. So, so I can speak from, from our use case. Um, we built a printer that's made for mission critical environments in extreme areas. So we're already looking at taking our technology right now and bringing it down to sea. Because you know, actually, um, the US Navy, for instance, doesn't actually have any printers on any of their ships, surprisingly. Um, so you know, this, this is just one example that we're looking at where, where you can make that happen. Um, I think for us, particularly, we, we, we look at a lot of our technologies that, we, that we're building, developing, and how we can kind of spin them off. Um, and that's kind of been, as you indicated, happened a lot uh, over the course of space exploration. Hey, Aaron. Uh, I was extremely skeptical at the beginning, but you won me over near the end. So, <laughs> so great job. Um, is this a space, pun intended, where you can wrap up the IP? Um, our IP lawyer keeps telling us that, so we keep paying him to, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, essentially, yeah. It, it, from, from what we've looked at, the answer is yes. So some space companies like uh, SpaceX, Elon Musk, they don't actually patent anything at all um, because they say, hey, their biggest competitors is governments and really winning over governments is hard. Um, but for us, uh, we, we're so early in a, in, a, in a new field where we feel we can get a lockdown on a lot of the, the technology that we're aggressively going after it. I, I just come from the energy space and there's a lot of applications I see in oil and gas and mining in these remote locations. So maybe we can talk. Okay, talk yeah, great, yeah. come talk to me. I think we had one more question over here. Is that still true? The question was about your business model because I thought you, you were only targeting, you know, made in space. And so the question is, how many of those machines do you think you could ever sell? But now, you, because you, you might even use it in remote locations, uh, I assume that, you know, th your potential market actually is it's bigger than I thought in the beginning. Yeah, well, first, I mean, even if we didn't go after, you know, you know, it's down here on Earth, which we definitely are because there's a lot of opportunities there, there's a lot of money to be made from the government and the space industry. I mean, Lockheed's like an $80 billion company. Um, I, well, yeah, but our product builds other products. So we're not selling, our, our goal, so, I mean, maybe I should convey this a little bit better. So, um, you know, obviously with 3D printers, you know, you can build multiple things. And our goal is to advance this capability so you can build more and more and more in space. So one thing I didn't actually mention in the talk um, is right now our, our first printer that we're sending up, NASA did a study and said that you could print about 30 to 40 percent of the stuff on the ISS with that. So I mean it's, and they also have billions of dollars in spare parts and stuff just lying around uh, um, um, up there. So our goal is basically to get build hardware in space um, you know, rapidly in the matter of hours and days rather than, you know, the years that it takes for space missions. And the goal is to get to things like satellites, complex stuff. And 3D print printing, you know, is, that's kind of the wave that we're riding, the exponential path that we're riding is going to enable that, but other, other exciting technology is going to enable it as well. Um, yeah. Thank you. Let's, oh. thank you We can talk much. later. Okay. Thank you, guys. Good job.